thank you so much for being here today to watch the lesson. Now remember, if you need to go back and watch a former lesson, you can go to learnbiblicalgiving.com. We're not asking for money there at all. It's just where we put these videos for you to find them and be able to use them at home, in school, church, wherever you have that need to learn about what does the Bible have to say about giving. Furthermore, we're going to be talking about the promised offering. Do you remember two weeks ago, we talked about the four kinds of offerings? There was the prescribed offering. That's the tithe. There was the preferred offering. That was a gift from the heart. There was a project offering. That was the offering that was given to Paul from the church at Philippi. And then we ended that lesson with the promised offering. Now the promised offering got its start here. And I ask you to turn there to Acts chapter 11. And I read this passage to you two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about what the wisest man who lived, Solomon, had to say about giving. And what he said about giving is really helping us to understand. We give no matter what the condition is. We give and know that God gives back, that we're never stingy in our giving, and we believe that God just supplies the need. Well, today, we're coming back to the fourth kind of offering. What is that called? The promised offering. Where do we get it from? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 11 and verse number 27. I'll read. If you're not there yet, just hit pause, and I'll wait for you, and then we'll come right back. All right, you have your place. And in these days came prophets. You say, well, Brother O'Malley, do we have prophets today? No, we don't have prophets today. The word of God is complete. But in that day, the word of God was not complete. So these were men who spoke for God. Where'd they come from? Well, the Bible says from Jerusalem. To where did they come? Antioch. And that's what we're going to read about. Why would prophets come from Jerusalem to Antioch? Verse 28. Well, the Bible gives us the name of one of the prophets. And there stood up one of them named Agabus. And signified by the Spirit, so he's speaking on behalf of God. Now, we know we don't do that today. We have the Word of God. It speaks to us. And stood up and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth. Brother O'Malley, what is a dearth? Well, a dearth is a famine. It's a, if you think about a drought and you think about a difficult time where there's no water, no rain, no crops growing, cattle are dying, no ability to feed people. It's really bad. It's severe. And this dearth was going to take place. Notice what it says. And signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. You say, okay, so the dearth happened, the famine happened. And when the famine happened, it was recorded that it was done. It occurred during the days of Claudius Caesar. You say, well, why would you say that? Well, because there are prophets, and prophets speak for God. When they speak for God, they had to be accurate because you didn't want anybody just standing up and saying, God told me to say this. And then if it didn't, the Bible says in the Old Testament that when if a prophet gave a prophecy that wasn't true, they were to be stoned. So it was in your best interest not to say, God said this. Now, how do we say God said this today? We have the word of God. That's how we know what God has to say. This is God's written word for us. But notice what it says. He stands up. He says there's going to be a dearth. The people hear about that. And then, of course, there's the statement that said it did come to pass. So the prophet's in the clear. Verse 29, here is the response of the church. Now, I want you to really catch what's happening here. Because this is, as far as we know, the first recorded time, the promised offering. One of the four tent poles. You remember the tent poles? The tithe, the prescribed offering. Then you have the preferred offering. That's an offering from a willing heart and a wise heart. Then you have the project offering, something we were doing for someone because they had a need. And then we have this promised offering. Here's where it starts. Verse 29, somebody says, well, I don't understand this faith promise thing. Where's that in the Bible? Well, you can introduce them to it here in verse number 29. So, well, I think that's all man made up. I don't see, I Googled for faith, promise, missions, giving in the Bible. I didn't get it. Well, you're not going to get it. But you are going to see faith. And you are going to see the ability of a Christian to make a promise. And you are going to be able to see giving. And you are able to see missions. 
But this is where we get it. You say, well, wait a minute. If they're giving, they're not giving to missions. Well, no, it'd be silly to say that this is missions. My mom, she used to sew when we were kids. She'd go down to the store and she'd buy a pattern. She'd get that pattern and then she'd also buy a couple different bolts of fabric. A bolt is what you call fabric wrapped around it. That's called a bolt. So she'd buy different pieces of fabric in order to make the outfit she wanted to make. Then she'd come home and she'd have these special kind of scissors and she'd cut out the fabric to the pattern. So let's say she had a purple dress over here that she was making and she'd take out the paper from the pattern, lay it on the fabric, and then she'd pin it all up and then take the scissors and she'd cut out to the size that she needed in that pattern to make that dress. So when she got done, she'd unpin the paper pattern. Then what would she do? She would get the other color fabric. So the other was purple and then this one is yellow. She'd lay that same pattern on a different color fabric. Now, I could ask you a question. Is it the same dress? Well, it is the same dress by pattern. You say, but it's two different colors. Well, that's where we are. We have a pattern. The color fabric for them was the dearth. The color fabric for us is missions. So what if we followed a biblical pattern of giving and then we just simply applied it to a different fabric. So if I come here and say, well, that's faith, promise, missions, giving. No, but it is a pattern. They had a famine or a dearth. And then they decided we're going to give. Let's read the verse. Verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, verse 30, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. What a statement. So, so the big picture is the church heard it. Well, you can imagine, let's say the group that you're in Sunday school class, adult Bible study class, or you're in a special membership class, whatever, whatever, you, however the, whatever the context is you're watching this, you hear that one of your fellow members, maybe even your neighbor, they have a fire in their house, God forbid, but they have a fire and they lose everything. Well, if that person is part of your church, what do you do? You say, well, we're gonna help them. Brother O'Malley, that's un it doesn't require any thought. We're gonna find out, do they have a place to stay tonight? Do they have clothes for the morning? Do they have the means of transportation? Do they have food? When's the last time they eat? Let's get them some food. What do we do all of that for? Because we believe in helping people. Our churches are there to be there for each other and bring glory to God in doing so. So here's what happened. They heard there was gonna be a dearth at the church from which they came miles away in Jerusalem. Many of them had scattered to Antioch. And so now they're there and they hear it and say, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? We're gonna make a commitment. You say, well, whoa, if they're in the famine now, why are they making a promise? Well, it's a prophecy. So that means it hasn't happened yet. You say, wow, how did that work? Well, this is not the only time God ever used Advanced notice, Joseph with his dream about the famine in Egypt. Agabus and the crew from Jerusalem saying there's going to come a famine. So now we see that, that there's time for them to give. So what did they do? Well, if you look at verse 29, the Bible said they made a promise. You said, well, how do they know what the prices were going to be of stuff? How did they know what was going to happen? They just simply made a promise of faith. So when I look at this introduction in the history or the start of giving by a promise or the promised offering, there are some things I learned. Number one, the promised offering has a purpose. What was their purpose? Well, it was the dearth, the famine. What's our purpose? Remember the purple fabric and the yellow fabric? The purple fabric was one dress, move the pattern over to the yellow fabric, and it became a yellow dress. One pattern, two dresses. One pattern of offering, their, their dearth was a literal drought condition. 
our famine, it's the famine of the gospel. So we're applying this in missions. The Bible says, then the disciples, every man according to his ability. Let's talk about some of those things. First of all, the promise offering will have a purpose. We use the promise offering pattern to help us give to missions. Here's the second thing. The promised offering has a place. You say, what do you mean a place? What well, we do are giving through church. Our kids are married here. Our family members are buried here. We bring our prayer requests here. We come here for worship and we do our giving here. We do all of that through our church. God didn't send a prophet to the town square. He sent a prophet to the church. God didn't send a prophet to anywhere else but his church. Why? Because we do our giving through our church. So the promise offering has a purpose. Theirs was a famine. We're using ours for mission. Purple dress, yellow dress, same pattern. The promised offering has a place. God's house. Why? Because the commission to bring the world to Christ was given to the church. The church is what he paid for. The church is what he founded. The church is to whom he gave ordinances. The church is to whom he gave his promise. He is the one that has entrusted us with the gospel for us to advance the gospel around the world. So the promised offering has a purpose, missions. The promised offering has a place, the local church. Then what else? Verse number 27, 29, excuse me, then the disciples. Well, the promise offering has people. Who are the people? Disciples. Who are disciples? Followers of Christ. The pupils, the learners, the students, those who follow Christ. They are the students of Christ. So now, who are the people that give in the promised offering? Well, the promised offering had a, a place, the church, had a purpose, the famine, and now it has people who give in this offering. These are, they're not perfect people, my goodness. There's no one perfect in church. Don't listen to people who say they're perfect. They're not. We're all sinners saved by grace. But here is what I'm telling you. They are just normal people with messed up issues, but they see a need and they give it. Why? Because they're a people in a place with a purpose. Well, that's the promised offering. What else does the promised offering have? Well, it has partners. Go back here to verse 29. Then the disciples, watch these next words, every man. You see, wait, wait Brother O'Malley, you mean everybody can give in the promised offering? They believed it. I believe it. There's an opportunity for us to be a part of this. You say, do you think women can give? Well, sure. Do you think kids can give? Of course. Do you think men can give? Absolutely. Do you think teenagers can give? Absolutely. Every man. You say, well, that's, that says man. That must be male. Well, there's also another word for man that's the idea of mankind. Anybody can give. So we see the partners in the offering. I'm not over here doing my own thing. I'm working with others and my offering comes in and their offering comes in and we make promises to give and then what? And then we see God meet the need. Number, number four, or number five, I want you to see the promised offering had participation. You say, what do you mean participation? Go back to the verse. Every man, that's the partners, according to his ability. So what does that mean? Well, each of us have a capacity of faith. Those people there that sat there that day and heard that there was going to be a dearth, they wanted to make a commitment to help them. But each of them had a capacity of faith. If you have a job and this one doesn't have a job or you have a large income and you have a small income, the common denominator, the common link between you both is you both have faith. Each of you have a capacity to trust God. Not to say, what's in my bank account? We can give this. It's what can I believe God for? Because there they are in advance of the, of the prophecy, in advance of the dearth. In fact, if we read and we'll get there in one of our lessons, we're going to get to 2 Corinthians and you're going to read about a group of churches that had their offering together a year earlier. So we know there was some time between the prophecy and the dearth, and the churches kept helping. You say, the churches? It wasn't just Antioch? No, it wasn't just Antioch. In fact, in the New Testament, there are 33 named churches in the New Testament. 
Brother O'Malley, I had no idea. I know. 33 named churches, well over 20 of them were involved in the promised offering. And we'll see that as we go. We're going to have a different lesson each week on different churches that were involved in the promised offering, what Paul had to say. So I need you to understand they had participation. It wasn't just that every man gave, but they gave according to their ability. Everybody has a capacity of faith to trust God. For some people, you could trust God for an amount greater than your tithe. And other people have a capacity to trust God for a smaller amount. But whatever the amount you can trust God, just trust him because you can always trust him. Number six, I want you to see this, that the promised offering, I know this is going to sound silly, but the promised offering had a promise. Say, the promised offering had a promise. That sounds like gobbledygook. Well, the promised offering is the mode of giving, and it came with a promise. Notice, go back to 29. Every man, according to his ability, watch these words now, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. What is determined? What's a promise? My wife and I have been married for more than 30 years. 1986, we got married. And when I think about the promises we made then, we really meant well, but we had no idea what life would bring. Here in church, we see these folks, and they're promising to give. They're determining to send relief. They don't know what all the year is going to hold, but they know this. They're making a commitment to give to those in need. They're making a commitment to remember those who are in need. They're making a commitment to their church and to the Lord. So when we talk about the promised offering, we're talking about this one thing. There is an ability we have to give. And when we take that ability to give and trust God for, we have to realize that's a promise. You say, ah, I don't do promises at church. Okay, are you consistent with that? Did you make a promise to the credit card company? Did you make a promise to your car payment company? Did you make a promise to for your house? You say, oh, Brother O'Malley, that's different. Yeah, I know, one is God and the rest is the world. I think it's okay to make a promise. They did, and I'm looking at that, and I realize their promise was to bring relief to the brethren. There's one other point, seven points this morning. I know group leaders, there's going to be a lot to go over. And I encourage you to take the time to pick one or two points and, and make sure all your students got their answers filled in and such on the forms that you have. But here's the seventh point. The promised offering had a period. So what do you mean a period? Well, a length of time. Look at verse 30. Which also they did. So what do you mean which also they did? They made the promise and they kept the promise. They determined to send relief, and maybe verse 29 and verse 30 is kind of like a Reader's Digest version of it, that, that they made the promise, they gave the promise, and what did they do with it? Well, then they had the offering ready to be able to give to the elders at Jerusalem, and they did it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Wow. The promised offering had a purpose, a place, people and partners. They had participation. They had a promise. And they had a period of time that it's going to work. Group leaders, you're sitting there with your students and you all are listening and you're thinking through this. Go back over this section and make sure everyone in your class has this today, that they understand what this promised offering is. And maybe you're going to come up with a question that you can't answer. That's okay. Email us. Go to our website, learnbiblicalgiving.com, and click the link to email us, and we'll reply with an answer. And I want you to know this. The promised offering works. And it works in every church. Why? Because it's a biblical pattern. Purple fabric, yellow fabric, one pattern. The promised offering for a famine, and the promised offering for missions. Let me encourage you this week, talk about these things. Until next week, God bless you.